For the last three weeks, we have been looking at the subject of grace, what it is, what it does, what our response to grace is supposed to be. And that's where we, we finished up last week as we, we talked about the fact that grace demands a response. And with that response, either we accept God's grace or we reject it. Uh, God made his grace available for everyone, as we talked about, but it's not the a case or it's not the situation where God says, I'm going to force my grace on you. It's available, but you've got to choose, take that uh, gift in and choose to make that a part of your life. And God, it's the same pattern God has used throughout the history of man in that God has always made gifts available to man. And in most cases, he requires a response. We mentioned last week, Naaman dipping in the Jordan River seven times. And the response was either you dip and you are cleansed of your leprosy or you stay out and you stay uh, with that disease. You think about Israel as they were marching into the promised land. God was delivering to them a city that by every measure of the world's standards couldn't be taken. God said, I'm going to give it to you, but here's your response. Walk around it for seven days, blow the trumpet. Seventh day, walk around it seven times. When they did, they blew the trumpets on that last time, the walls fell down. Noah, the ark, God offering a gift of salvation, a gift of life. Noah's choice, build the ark or don't build it. Listen to God or don't. The same is for us today. Our response of faith, belief, baptism. And as we talked about last week, none of those acts that God has required could accomplish or pay for or take the place of the grace that God is supplying. They're just a response that he has asked for. We also noted last week that there are are multiple ways of rejecting the gift. And, and we, we spent just a little bit of time talking about that. Spent most of our time on what it means to accept the gift. But this week, I want us to spend just a, a little bit of time again thinking about the rejection side of this, or um, part of it's not going to be as much rejecting as, um, well, as our title, Abusing or losing God's gift of grace. A teaching that is, is out there in the world today is this thought of once saved, always saved. It's a comforting thought. It, it is um, a thought the, uh, that teaches that once you have been saved, Nothing can take that away from you. Problem is, there's some scriptures that sort of stand against that. And, and we're going to look at part of that today. Um, it, it is a, it, I, let me back up just a second to say, it is a statement that for the most part, for most people, in a sense, can be true. Uh, there are just certain circumstances where we can lose that. That's where we're going to kind of look at today so that we understand what those are. Um, faith versus the law is where we begin. Galatians chapter 2, Paul grown up knowing to observe the law of Moses, 
but who have now come out of idolatry and paganism to accept Christ as their Savior. They have uh, responded, as Paul has taught, to the grace of God. Uh, they have developed a belief, a faith. They have been baptized. They are in the grace of God. But as Paul writes to them, he is dealing with a group of Jewish Christians who are now telling those Gentile Christians, you have got to keep the law. You've got to go back. You've got to be circumcised the way the law of Moses said that we are to be circumcised. You've got to keep food laws that the law of Moses said we've got to keep. You've got to keep feast days and festivals and fast and, and all these different things that were under the law prior to Christ. So let's see what Paul has to say as he writes to them. Galatians chapter 2, beginning verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ, just uh, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. We, we look at this passage because as, as Paul begins laying this out, he, he's establishing it once again, just as he did in the Roman letter, we're saved by faith. It's not by works. I, I can't do anything to earn this. And so he's telling, even as Jews, we should know we can't be saved by keeping the law. We couldn't keep the law good enough. That's why Jesus came in the first place. So why are we trying to come back and now and tell somebody else, you've got to keep the law to be saved? We couldn't do it ourselves. And so as he begins this, he, he says, we know that's the case. We know it has to be by faith in Christ. We know that the law will in itself never save anyone. And then he got to that, those concluding two verses where he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Well, how did he say to the Romans that we do that? Romans 6, those of us who have been baptized have been crucified with Christ. But he says, I no longer live. Uh, the me that was died at that moment and was buried with Christ. He talked about there in Romans 6, being buried with Christ, resurrected with Christ. But he says, now Christ lives in me. The life that I'm living, I live by faith in Christ. It's not about me keeping the law. It's not about how perfectly I keep it or trying to keep it. It's not about what feast days I celebrate. It's not about circumcision. It's not about any of those things. He's laying the case for them to understand that has to be our understanding. The very last statement he made there, verse 21, if it were possible for righteousness to be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. 
What Paul's saying is, if you could save yourself by keeping the law perfectly, you wouldn't need Christ. There was no need for him to come. There was no need for him to die. It would just simply be the case, either we kept the law and earned our salvation, or we didn't keep it and we died lost. We can never keep it. The only one who has ever kept that law perfectly was Jesus himself, the Son of God. So Paul says, Christ didn't die for nothing. Christ died because that is the only way for us to be saved, for us to be in grace. He spends the next several chapters dealing with various aspects of that. We arrive at chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. (coughs) Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have alienated yourselves from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So as Paul writes that, He's telling them, you've got to make a decision. Either you are going to try to be justified by the law, by your ability to keep the law, which is a losing proposition, because nobody can do it. But if you choose that, you're choosing that instead of God's grace. If you listen to those telling you you've got to be circumcised to be saved, if you're listening to those that are telling you you've got to keep feast days and food laws and, and, and all these other works that were spelled out under the law of Moses, then you're obligated to the entire law. You, you're trying to justify yourself by the law. It's a very similar thing uh, one of the early lessons I, I mentioned, we, we sometimes, we, we get this checkbox mentality. We're, we're going to keep a list of what I've done right in this column and what I've done wrong in this column. And, and every time I do something wrong with the checkbox mentality, it says, okay, I've got to put a checkbox in the good column to, to counteract that bad spot. And if when I reach the end of life, I've got as many or more good marks as I have bad marks, I'm good to go. Well, that was the mentality of trying to keep the law. It was, (coughs) excuse me, it was the thought, uh, I can keep these laws. I I can, you know, I can remember feast days, I can do that. And besides, the law has built into it that if I forget that, I offer a sacrifice and that wipes it out and I'm right back to start. But you've got to keep that every day of your life until the final day of your life. Or you choose to live under the grace of God. Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. That's why he came. He lived under that law. He fulfilled that law so it could be done away with, so it could be set aside. 
so that we can be free from the burden of having to keep it perfectly. Paul says, don't let anybody send you back to it. Don't, don't let anybody tell you you've got to keep that law and, and do that in order to be saved. This becomes, in a sense, a tricky spot for us as Christians. We realize when we look at the law, there were the law of Moses fell into a lot of different components. There were moral laws, there were civil laws, there were health laws, all these different things. And some of them we dismiss in our minds easier than others as far as what we think we need to keep. <clears throat> we get to the moral laws of it, though. The Ten Commandments and, and the, some of the other aspects of what's right and what's wrong, what's sinful and what's not sinful. And as Christians, we understand those things are still pleasing or displeasing to God. Those things are things that still should be in my life in some form or fashion if I'm going to be a righteous person in God's sight. And, and so that, that becomes this problem for us because we, we have to walk this balance of understanding I'm not saved because of my ability to keep those things or add those things as part of my life. Jesus freed me from that in the sense of having to do that to save myself. I'm saved by His grace. But as Paul, and we saw this last week in the letter to the Romans, Chapter 6, beginning, shall we sin more so that grace abounds more? Because what it begins to sound like Paul is saying is, God freed us from all law, from any acts of goodness. All we have to do is have the grace of God and then we can just live. And that's not exactly right either. Because that is part of our response to grace. That was Paul there in Galatians 2 talking about, I died with Christ, but now I live, but it's not me, it's Christ living. I respond by accepting grace. I do those things that God tells me to accept grace, and then my life is supposed to be being changed to begin including all of these things that were part of the law but not added to my life in such a way that I think I've got to keep them in order to be saved. I keep them because I'm saved. I keep them because God is changing my life to become more like Christ. I, I'm doing those things because I, I'm striving for it to be Christ living in my place just as he died in my place. So I want those things to be a part of my life. But if I ever fall into that trap where I begin thinking, I'm doing such a great job of keeping these things. And where I begin thinking that it's only because I keep them that I'm saved. I'm negating the grace of God. And, and as Paul wrote, when I do that, I fall from grace. What does it mean to fall from grace? It means to lose the salvation that grace gives us. Why? Because I chose to take my faith from being in Christ to putting it in myself and my own ability to live this way. Living under grace does not exempt us from living in an effort to conform to the image of Christ, but it does exempt us from having to be perfect at it. 
Drop down and look at verse 13, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fil fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Let me pause there for just a second. You remember day of Pentecost when, when Peter and the others are giving that first sermon, and they get to the end of the sermon and, and the crowd is pricked in their hearts, what do we do? How, how do we fix this? Peter's answer doesn't say it in so many words, but, but the answer was, you can accept to believe in Christ. Respond to what he's done for you. He, he told that in the message of repent and be baptized for the remission of your sin. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We, we get that gift of the Spirit that Paul is talking about here in Galatians 5 <coughs> that is leading us to live better lives. Lives that are based on love for God and love for neighbor. Lives that are, are based on what the Spirit is after that is contrary to the laws of flesh or the desires of flesh. So let me pick back up verse 17. We'll reread that last part of it before we go forward. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. That was Romans 6. Shall we sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. The Spirit leads us in a different way. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. How can Paul say that if they're living in grace? To live like that is to be rejecting what God has told us. We'll, we'll get to that more here in just a second. But the fruit of the Spirit, the things the Spirit is leading us to, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Paul says it's not about our ability to keep these things, but it is about our striving for them. I don't have to keep it perfectly. I never will. I'll never fully accomplish that. The grace of God makes up for that. 
And so what Paul begins to introduce is, is the ideal that there is a difference, however, between failure and abuse. I, I can reject God's grace outright, or I can choose to, to live under it and, and strive to, to live by the Spirit, realizing that that means there are aspects of the law that I'll try to keep, but I'm not bound by that. And that there's going to be times that I'll fail. And the grace of God will clean me up and present me back whole before God. But there's a difference between that and abuse. That list of things of the flesh that he said there, those are abuses. And we see that brought out more in the Hebrew letter, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. The Hebrew writer says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Before we read the rest of our verses, let that sink in for a second. If we deliberately keep on sinning, not that I am trying to live by the Spirit, but I have a failure, uh, not that I hit my thumb with the hammer and some unchoice words came out, uh, not that you know, whatever it is that is, is one of those things that in the moment I made the mistake, I made the wrong choice, I, I whatever. If I deliberately keep sinning. And you think back to that list, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envies, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Are there some of those that you could get into by mistake? Yeah. There are some of those that you could have a one-off mistake in. But the majority of those, if you are living in that lifestyle, you are there deliberately. You've made a choice. I like what I'm doing. I want what I'm doing. This brings me whatever. I know God has taught me that this is wrong. That's where the Hebrew writer is talking about here. I, I know that this is wrong because I've received the knowledge of the truth. I have been brought into the grace of Christ. But I've now made up my mind I'm going to keep doing it anyway. It's no longer a mistake. It's deliberate. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Well, we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Hebrew writer is telling us, if we deliberately keep sinning, we fall from grace. Both situations, the Hebrew writer and what Paul was writing to the Galatians, the warning is you can be in grace and you can lose that because you end up putting your faith, your trust, 
your desires somewhere other than Jesus Christ. Somewhere other than the grace of God. For us to be saved by grace, we have got to be fully accepting, believing, trusting in the grace of God and what Jesus did for us. I can't earn it, but I can lose it. I live by grace, by an understanding that God covers my failures with the sacrifice of Christ. Because he does, I don't have to live under the burden of trying, uh, the burden and the pressure of, of never messing up. And by living under grace, my goal as a thank you and as a response to, the, to God and his gift is I'm going to try to be more like Christ. I'm going to try to live more by the things that you have told me are pleasing your sight, more in the way of the things that the Spirit leads me to do, to love God, to love my neighbor, to make everything around me better, because I'm better by the grace of God. We need to be aware that Satan is still out there and Satan still lies. Just as he did in the garden, Satan wants us to believe that we're equal to God. I can find my way. I can save myself without Christ. I can earn my way. I can make up for my failures in some way. And Satan's right there saying, yep, you can do that. You don't need Jesus. You don't need his grace. That was Satan working where Paul was writing for those who were saying, just keep the feast days. Just be circumcised. Just do these other things and, and that'll earn this for you. Satan's also there every time that we fail to tell us See, that just proves you're too bad for the grace of God. You're, you're so bad, you don't deserve God's grace, and you can never have God's grace. He wants to make us feel guilty to the point that we reject the forgiveness. Don't listen to the lies. God's grace can save you. Even as we talk about these, these things that we could put our hope in, sometimes we mess up and do put our hope in, even though we have these moments where we, we fail to fulfill what we know is moral and right in the sight of God, and to a certain degree, even when we get into this deliberate stuff, if we're drawing breath, there's a hope we can get back out of that. Though Satan will try to tell you otherwise. Next week, we're going to look at the subject of grace and sin. And in doing that, we're going to try to find this Balance, I guess I want to say. Of understanding how dangerous sin can be. But also how forgivable sin is. To the point that Scripture tells us there's only one unforgivable. And so we'll, that, that's what we're going to look at is 
what's that un, one unforgivable, and what are the circumstances around these others that make them forgivable or make them the point that we fall from grace. As far as I know, that's going to wrap up our grace series. As we wrap this up for today, God's grace is available. It is there for every person to accept. And I guess I leave off this morning with the same question I left off with last week. Have you accepted the grace of God? Or have you in some way been rejecting it? Are you living in the grace of God? Or have you in some way put yourself in a position to be fell from grace? God wants us living, breathing, walking in his grace with him. There's something we can do this morning to assist you in that. Let us know as we stand together and sing. Vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified.